Ruth chapter 4. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you. And I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Chilion, and Mahlon. I've also acquired Ruth, the Moabites, Marlon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are my witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home, like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this woman. May your family be that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons he has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, 
was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashalon. Nashalon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was beautifully read. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to try some new technology today. <laughs> we'll see. If, I'll, I'll assume people will shout if it doesn't work. And um, I'm going to ask Mark to spotlight me if he can uh, as we start. Okay. The story so far. Obviously, Naomi uh, has lost in the chapter one, she lost her husband, uh, and Ruth lost her husband, as did Orpah. And then, through a variety of circumstances, Naomi hears that there's bread back in Bethlehem, in the, the promised land, and they return. And this story has a lot about returning. And upon their return, they come at the beginning of the barley harvest, which I think shows real hope for the future. And then they meet and hear about this uh, redeemer, Boaz, uh, who is the one that can save them. Really, he's like a savior because he can buy the land or look after the land for Naomi. He can uh, marry Ruth and provide an heir so that the name of Elimelech does not die out forever. And so that Naomi's uh, family line does not die out and uh, a son will be born who can look after Naomi in her old age. Now we've hit the climax of the story, chapter four. And um, before I talk about chapter four though, I wanna just say really to study Ruth, we could do this <laughs> for eight weeks. It's such a rich, rich book. There are so many layers. I just wanna say a few little comments before we look at chapter four. One thing I'd like to point out is this book is about everyday life, isn't it, in many ways? Uh, everyday life on the farm. <laughs> you know, marriage, harvest, um, intimate relationships. It's not battles. It's not huge miracles like the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, and I just want to encourage you that the Lord can use small things, small decisions, everyday things in your life. Don't think you've got to be some big boy up the front. <laughs> or big girl, <laughs> it's the Lord can use acts of loving kindness. I mean, this story is replete with acts of loving kindness and generosity, and the Lord uses those things. So I want to encourage you, don't despise the small things you might do, like a phone call, a text, a visit. The Lord can trigger great things through acts of kindness in the everyday. A second little thing I'd like to mention that blessed me is the fact that Boaz becomes the answer to his own prayer. In chapter two, verse 12, Boaz says to Ruth, he says, may the Lord, in verse 12 of chapter two, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have taken refuge. And Boaz becomes the answer to his own prayer. So I want to encourage you, you pray for someone, well, just listen out. Maybe the Lord wants to use you as part of the answer to your own prayer. So let's go into um, our one last comment uh, about chapter, uh, about the book of Ruth. And um, you're going to see the new technology coming up, I hope, on the screen now. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, Ruth's origins. Um, I don't know if you realize that Ruth obviously is a Moabite. There's a lot made of the fact in chapters one and two that Ruth is a Moabite. She's a foreigner. Uh, she's from what the Israelites classed as a cursed people. And the reason for that is because of the her ancestral origins. Because what happened in the beginning of the Moabite race? You will remember the story of Lot. Lot and his daughters were plucked out of Sodom before Sodom was destroyed in Genesis 19. And Lot's wife gets turned into a pillar of salt. And he's so traumatized by it, he goes into a cave with his daughters, but he doesn't bother to seek for them husbands. 
And in the night, these unmarried women approach this older man in the dark who's had wine to drink, and they are desperate to preserve the family line. And they commit incest with their own father. And from that is born the Moabites. Now, the word Moab means from a father. Uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites came from this union. Now, the question you could ask, or at least we should be asking, is when Ruth approached Boaz at night, who, and remember, Boaz was an older man, and remember, Boaz had had some wine to drink, and remember, Ruth was desperate to keep the family line going, we're meant to ask ourselves, will she do the same as her ancestors? Will she seduce this older man, just like Lot's daughters did? But we see that it's absolutely pure. It's righteous. The, the, the sexual restraint is amazing. Even Boaz, if you think about it, Boaz was the grandson of Rahab, who was a prostitute. And here, Boaz is restrained. And what can this teach us? Well, what it teaches us is that Ruth, uh, through this action, she redeems her family line. She redeems the line of her family. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but it says, Lot is remembered and redeemed by this action. You see, God has not forgotten Lot's family line. Through Ruth's purity, it is reincorporated into the covenant people of God. The mistakes and sins of our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents need not be ours. The cycle can be broken. And I want to just say this before we look at chapter four. Nothing in our past is a barrier to being folded into the purposes of God. It's lovely how God remembered Lot's line and Ruth, in a sense, redeemed the name of Lot's family. So I want to encourage you, don't let your past ever stop you from going into God's blessings, for they do not. God can, re he's a redeemer. <laughs> That's the wonderful uh, news. Okay, chapter four then. And we're gonna look at it in two halves. I'm gonna look at part one, which is verses one to 11. Uh, 1 to 11a. And I'd like to start by uh, showing you this picture. Because we read uh, in this story that uh, Boaz in chapter 4 went to somewhere called the town gate. Now, just to explain, the town gate wasn't just a, a gate into the city, it was a place where people could come and sit down with benches. Uh, it's like um, in that photograph uh, you can see there. It was a place of legal uh, decision making. And um, as you can see in that picture there, place where the elders would sit down uh, and they would uh, enact legal decisions. So this first part of the chapter, you get these three things. You get the town gate, which is a place of legal decision making uh, in verse one. Then you get this repeated phrase, sit down, sit down. It says, Boaz sat down. Then he saw the other uh, redeemer who could redeem, and he tells him to sit down. So he went and sat down. Then he took 10 of the elders, and they all went and sat down, and they did so. And there's a repetition. And the idea of being seated, just so you know, uh, is, is the idea of um, legal decisions uh, being made, the posture of a legal decision. So what we're getting in this picture is a serious bit of legal business something really serious and legal is happening and he also gets witnesses to come you know which are the guarantee uh, of the legal decision so something very legal is happening something very above board and I believe the reason this is put in this story is to show us that the redemption that Boaz is going to do is absolutely uh, grounded in covenant righteousness it's absolutely solid, rock solid, sure, um, and absolutely above board. And I want to just encourage you that your redemption, 
Your salvation in Jesus Christ is built on solid ground, utterly solid. It's built on God's covenant commitment, uh, legally witnessed by the Holy Spirit, by God the Father, by the angels in heaven. It is absolutely sure. So I want to encourage you, even if you sin this week or you sinned last week, if you come back to the Lord, you, there is absolute solid ground uh, in Christ for you based on his covenant. Now, we read uh, in uh, verse 3 uh, that Boaz says that this, um, to the guardian redeemer that he calls over to sit down, he says that Naomi has a piece of land. He says, Naomi has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. And he says to him, I thought I should bring the matter to your attention, suggest you buy it in the presence of these seated here. Okay, so you may ask, hang on a minute. If Naomi had land, why did Ruth have to go off gleaning in someone else's field? You know, surely Naomi, if she had a field, surely Ruth could have gone to that field. Or maybe Naomi could have paid people to harvest her own field. Why is it Ruth has to go off to someone else's field? And I think the reason for that is because they've been away for 10 years in Moab. And I think someone just took over the land. Uh, maybe someone just occupied this unused land because it was 10 years that they'd been gone. And or maybe Naomi had sold it. We don't know. But the, the truth is she needed someone to get the land back into the family. She needed a strong kind of guardian redeemer. She needed some strong man who can get the land back into the family. And that is why she needs uh, Boaz. Okay. Now I need to explain something about this uh, guardian redeemer. <clears throat> I'll just read what's on the screen. A guardian redeemer was a close, influential male relative to whom members of the extended family could turn for help. Uh, this was usually when a family line or possessions were in danger of being lost forever. And the guardian redeemer was responsible to do this, to get the land. He was responsible to buy back the dead man's family land so that he would keep it uh, within the family line. And you can read about that in Leviticus 25, 25, if you really want to. The other responsibility of this kind of savior or rescuer, this guardian redeemer, was to provide a male heir for the dead man. So for instance, Elimelech died, he had no children. Naomi's left as a widow. She has no children. She's got no one to look after her in her old age. She's got no one to keep the land. So the redeemer had to marry the widow or the daughter-in-law or someone in that family to provide a son. And then the land would in the future pass to this son who would become the heir of the dead man's land. He would keep the dead man's family name alive and keep the land with the family. So the heir, the son, was really, really important. And the other responsibility uh, of the guardian redeemer was to care for any relatives. So he would have to care for Naomi, you know, this old, older lady. He would have to care for her as long as she lived. You can read about all these things uh, in the verses on the screen, but uh, it was a very serious responsibility. But this is the thing that not many people realize. It was a choice. You didn't have to do it. You could refuse. I mean, it wasn't uh, very, a very good idea to refuse because you would get shunned and sort of shamed, but you could refuse. And I want to encourage us that in Christ, Christ chose to be our redeemer. It, he didn't have to. God did not have to be our redeemer, but he chose before the very beginning of this world that Jesus would be the offering. Uh, it was all planned. So let's go back to the uh, story. She needs this guardian redeemer to come and buy the land back. So Boaz, however, discovers that there's another redeemer. You could have more than one, you see. And this other redeemer, who's unnamed, he has no name, was next in line before Boaz. So he calls him, like in the picture there, he's saying, Oi, 
come over here. We need to sit down and work out what's going to happen. Um, now, I always draw your attention to what happens whilst they sit down in verses four to six. This is really important. <laughs> Boaz says to the man, he says, if you will redeem Naomi's land, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you. And I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. But then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, oh, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it for yourself. I cannot do it. <laughs> now, what's going on here? This is really important. You see, when Boaz said, there's some land for sale and Naomi owns it, this old lady, the guy, the other guy said, oh, I'll, I'll redeem it. Yeah. Do you know why? The reason is because he thought, okay, there'll be a bit of a cost. You know, I've got to feed Naomi, this old lady. I'll feed her until she dies. But when she dies, I'll get the land back. Right. And I'll have more land. That's what he was thinking. But Boaz says, hang on a minute. It's more costly than that. He says, if you take this land, you've also got to marry Ruth. And then the guy goes, oh, I can't do that. And the reason is because it's costly. I'll tell you why it's costly. One, he would have to feed Ruth as well. Two, if Ruth has children, he would have to feed the children of Ruth as well. Three, once the children grow up, the land passes to them. So he doesn't get the land. It's like a triple whammy of cost, 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 cost. Feed Ruth, feed her kids, give the land up. And fourthly, there was another cost. You know, if other children spring up, it might endanger the inheritance that he has set aside for his other kids, because he probably had other kids, this guy. So all he is seeing before him is cost, 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 cost. This redemption is costly. So he turns it down. And I think the point of having uh, this unnamed man in the story is to contrast with Boaz, to contrast his unwillingness to pay the cost, contrast with Boaz, who is very willing to pay the cost. So what is this um, teaching us? I think it's just teaching us this. Redemption is really, really costly. It cost God everything uh, to redeem us, uh, but he was, Jesus was willing to pay the price. Um, there's the little, ver little sort of phrase I'd like you to remember. Every blessing comes through costly redemption, uh, really, really costly. Um, every blessing that we uh, experience now and in the future after we, are di after we die and go to be with the Lord is, is, is only come to us through great, great cost. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, uh, it says these words. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. You know, it cost God a life, uh, this, this great redemption. So that's the first, I think, the real meaning of those first 11 verses. Redemption is really, really costly. You ought to be thankful to God for all those uh, blessings that come through it. Um, let's go back to the second section now, part two. This is towards the, the second half, uh, right until the end. And um, I want to just bring out to you that really this is the dawning of hope. It's like things turn a corner because once Boaz agrees uh, to redeem the blessing is like a, a floodgate is opened and so many blessings come uh, across to um, Ruth and Naomi's family. And these are the blessings that we read about. If you look at um, verse 11, the second half of verse 11, this is incredible. The elders who are the witnesses, they say, may the Lord woman who's coming into your home 
Become, may the Lord make her like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. What they are saying here is, may uh, Ruth become like a patriarchal mother of Israel. You know, we need to understand that Ruth is a Moabite. She's a widow. She's childless. And now these people are saying, may you be like the patriarchal mothers of Israel. It's just like, what? You're going to be so different to what you were like because of the rich blessing of God. And then if you look at verse, um, sorry, later on, it talks about Boaz as well. May you have great standing um, in Epaphra, that's to Boaz. And then he talks about the offspring. He says, may your offspring in verse 12, that the Lord gives you by this young woman, be like that of Perez. And you might say, well, who, who's Perez? Well, all it really means, I think, is Perez was a significant family line. And God is really, really blessing Ruth and Naomi. You see, if you come back to the Lord and just walk with him, he will utterly bless you. He bless your socks off. That's the message of this little section. And then if you look at verse 13, it says, Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. He made love to her. The Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. Now, you might think, well, that's pretty normal. Well, it isn't. Not for Ruth. Do you remember Ruth had been 10 years in Moab and had never had a child? Ruth was barren. But here in the purposes of God, God opened her womb. Just like he did for Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. Just like he did for various uh, couples when, when, you know, something significant was going to happen. Um, he made her fruitful in her womb. And then the last uh, thing I've got on the screen there is blessings of hope for the future. And if you look at verses 14 down to 17, um, it says this. Uh, the, wom the women, this is the women talking now, the women of Bethlehem. They say to Naomi, praise the Lord to the Lord who has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. And their son uh, who was Obed, his name was Obed, <laughs> he became, he was the father of Jesse, and then Jesse was the father of King David. So in a way, he did become really famous. Um, it's amazing how there's a huge future here. Uh, king David was going to come out of all of this, the great king, the, the sort of high point of all of um, Israel's history, really. And uh, there's a little strange phrase uh, in verse 15, I just want to quickly draw your attention to, where they say of this uh, redeemer this, and the child that will come, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Then, then they say this about Ruth. For your daughter-in-law, Ruth, who loves you, and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Now, you might wonder, why do they mention why do they say Ruth is better than seven sons? I think the reason is this. If you try and link it with David, King David, Jesse had seven sons, but the eighth one, who was it? <laughs> it was David. The eighth son was David. And what this is really trying to say is Ruth, who's gone from being a foreign Moabite, and Naomi, who's gone from being starved and empty, have now come right bang center into God's purposes because they came back to the Lord. And King David, the eighth son, who's going to rule over Israel, is going to be the hope for their future. I think it's just wonderful how God utterly embarrasses them with these blessings. And I want to say to you, because we're going to close soon, God wants to embarrass you with his lavish blessings. He wants to pour out so much upon you. Don't ever think God is a stinge. Things may not always work out in this life, but God has an incredible amount of blessing stored up for you, especially in the life to come. And I think the message of verses 11 to 22 is simply this. These blessings anticipate a greater fullness to come in Christ. Um, the fullness that we see in Christ, by the way, 
is, is pictured in this story. You know, Naomi goes from emptiness and starvation and death and despair and sorrow to a place of fullness at the end of chapter four. You know, she's got a child in her arms who's going to look after her. The land is safe. The name is safe. There's going to be a, they're folded into the very heart of God's purposes to bring in King David. It's, it's glorious. But you see, this is a shadow of the fullness that we will get one day in Christ. Let me just read to you these scriptures from the New Testament. Colossians 1.19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's in Jesus. Colossians 2, verses 9 to 10, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. John 1.16, out of his fullness, we have all received. So you see, what I'm trying to say today is this is a picture of the fullness we, we have in Christ. Now, we get lots of blessings in this life, but I want to guarantee you that in the next life, you will be absolutely full beyond compare. Because I want to just point out something to make this a bit clearer. Um, if you look at the picture there on the screen, I've put a quote uh, by a Puritan. His name was John Flavel. He lived in the 1600s. And uh, he said that the blessings we get in this life on this earth, they are known as the blessings of the footstool. That's how he called them. You know, something that you put your feet on. Yeah, really you know, important, but they're not the ultimate. And then he talks about the blessings of the throne. And you see, I've got a picture of a throne there. And what, he, what John Flavel meant by that was he meant the blessings, the eternal blessings that all Christians will have, the eternal blessings of God. And I just wanted to say to you that you may not get everything in this life that you wanted. You may not uh, for example, get that husband you wanted, or you may not get that child, or you may not get that job you wanted. But I want you to remember these are blessings of the footstool. God does give us lots and lots of blessings, and he will embarrass us in ways we don't expect. But I want to say to you, this life is just a foretaste. It's like a footstool. But the next life, you will get the blessings of the throne. You will get uh, all of God's blessings richly poured out to you because you are in Christ. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, there's so much we could talk about in Ruth, but I, I want to leave us with a challenge. As well as all the things we've learnt about God's goodness, about returning to the Lord, and, and, and all the great wonders that await us in Christ, I want to just challenge us with the theme of loving kindness. Because you see, in this story, the significance of loving kindness in bringing about things is really quite important. You know, Boaz is really generous to Naomi and Ruth. He gives them piles and piles of grain. He gives them lapfuls of grain. And he allows Ruth to uh, glean with the workers. You know, and he's very willing to pay the cost of redemption. You know, he's very willing to do it. So there's a theme of generosity. And then you've got Ruth. Look at Ruth's loving kindness to Naomi. You know, she uh, for, forwent any possible husband in Moab in order to be covenantly kind uh, to Naomi. And I just want to encourage us to, in this church, Christ Church Hall, to not underestimate kindness, loving kindness. I encourage you to go and show loving kindness more and more to people around you. Because you see, through that, the loving kindness of God can work. I remember I went to preach in a village in India about two, three years ago, and I was really, really nervous having to preach to like, I don't know, 300 people, 400 people in a village at the gospel. And a brother came up to me and he said this to me, he said, Simon, he said, I know you're nervous. He said, just love them. Just love them. He said, if you love them, the Holy Spirit can work. And I did. I just, I'm just going to love these people. And I did. And the Holy Spirit flowed through loving kindness. And, um, 
The covenant kindness of God is expressed through the kindness of his people. Our loving kindness can be an overflow of God's loving kindness. We are called at Christ Church Hill, we are called to be men and women of loving kindness that God will then flow through us his loving kindness. The Lord bless you. And uh, I really love this series on Ruth. Let's just pray a moment and then we will go back to our last song. Father, we thank you for the richness uh, that is found in this book of Ruth. Uh, I pray that we would uh, be a people of loving kindness, Lord. I pray we would be a people who are the answers to our own prayers at times. I pray we would be a people who are willing to really come to you and trust you with all the blessings you wish to give us. Oh, Lord, thank you for this book. I pray you would help us uh, not forget it in the days ahead. Thank you that you love us and you paid the cost for our redemption. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, we're now going to um, sing our final song, which you will have already seen is called uh, Faith, What a Faithful God Have I.